The human mind is always working out its own plans. Still, the challenge is to know what aligns with divine will. What does God desire of us? God's wisdom leads us to his will. When not guided by divine wisdom, we are prone to conflict with divine will. In the gospel, Jesus shows that the cost of discipleship does not fit into our human thinking. In our first reading today, the author of wisdom teaches us how to unravel divine will. Human beings find it hard to know God's will for several reasons. First, the intentions of mortals are unsure. We do not have an infallible sense of judgment on issues because we often look at things from myopic human experiences and situations. Second, our intentions are unstable. Today we may desire one thing and the next day have a distaste for what was trending the day before. Third, the perishable human body suppresses the soul, the divine aspect of us. By contrast, the Holy Spirit, that is the divine wisdom, is imperishable, it is eternal. And to discover divine will, we must look beyond the things of this world. Fourth, we are distracted by so much work on earth that we have no time or little time for the things of heaven. God sends his Holy Spirit to teach and guide us to discover divine wisdom. The benefits of divine wisdom are that those who possess it are guided here on earth, their paths are straight and they learn to please God and do his will. The psalmist amplifies the limitedness of the human being. We are mere dust with a short span of life, like grass which springs up in the morning, withers and fades by evening. Knowing the shortness of our lives should teach us wisdom and inspire us to rely on God. The second reading is from Paul's letter to Philemon, verses 9 to 10 and 12 to 17. This is Paul's shortest but easy to read letter consisting of just one chapter and 25 verses. The subject matter of the letter is the issue of Onesimus, Philemon's runaway slave, whom Paul sent back to him to receive no longer as a slave but as a brother in Christ. Like many elites of his era, Philemon was a wealthy Roman citizen who owned slaves. He first experienced Christ when he met Paul and later became a follower of Jesus, serving as the leader of the church that convened in his home. However, his slave Onesimus had wronged him and fled for an unexplained reason. He also met Paul and later became both a follower of Jesus and Paul's disciple. Now Paul faces a dilemma of both legal and Christian implications. So as a Christian, he had to inform Philemon, his friend and Christian brother, about the situation with Onesimus. However, the legal consequences were left to Philemon's decision. Therefore, Paul expertly makes his case to persuade Philemon to treat Onesimus, his returned slave, with Christian love. First, he refers to himself as an old man, in Greek, presbytes, which also means ambassador or one with authority. Hence, he does more than just play on his age. He actually suggests that he is a wise and experienced man who deserves to be heard. Then he pleads for Onesimus, calling him, my child, tu emuteknu, and my very heart, emasplankna. These references highlight their close relationship. Paul also addressed only Timothy and Titus as my child. 
Onesimus is a Greek name that means useful, profitable, or beneficial. So, playing on the name in verse 11, Paul said, Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and me. Consequently, to bring about the reconciliation between Philemon and Onesimus, Paul, who adores Onesimus as a son, was willing to make a significant sacrifice that mirrors Christ's sacrifice of giving up everything for us. Therefore, Paul counseled Philemon to take back Onesimus no longer as a slave, but as a brother in the Lord. He knew it would be difficult for Philemon to deal with Onesimus, so he attests that he trusts the new Onesimus and regards him as a brother in Christ. Hence, Paul made Onesimus a slave, Philemon a wealthy landowner, and himself a prisoner at the time to be equal in Christ despite their different social standings. This is the divine wisdom at work, wisdom that unifies, liberates, and flourishes, transcending human intentions of division, categorization, and discrimination. The Gospel reading is from Luke chapter 14, verses 25 to 33. The passage provides us with the conditions and cost of discipleship. A disciple, Matthias, is an apprentice, a student, someone who practically follows in the footstep of a master so that he can become like the master. In the New Testament, Matthias has a spiritual connotation referring to someone who attaches himself to a spiritual leader. In our passage, Jesus is the spiritual leader and a large crowd was following him. He stopped and explained to them what it means to really follow him. Following Jesus involves two important steps. The first is detachment from family and self. The second step is to embrace a Christ-like attitude. In explaining how a disciple should be detached, Jesus uses the Greek word miseo. This verb means to hate, that is, to feel intense or passionate dislike for someone or something, to have a strong aversion to something. So, the disciple has to hate their father, mother, brothers and sisters, and even his or her own life. If Jesus is expecting us to break familial or blood ties, how much more other ties that might become obstacles to following Jesus? In human logic, to hate oneself and one's family members is absurd. How does Jesus expect me to hate my loved ones and ultimately hate myself? To understand Jesus' statement, we have to look at how he uses the verb miseo. This Greek term has undergone what scholars refer to as Hebraism. It's a Greek word, yet it expresses the thought spirit or practice characteristic of the Hebrews. So instead of having the Greek meaning of hatred, it indicates the love that the disciple ought to have for his master. So in using Miseo, Jesus is expressing the intensity of love that the disciple should have. The disciple should love Jesus more than life itself. As the psalmist says in Psalm 63, Verse 3, O Lord, your faithful love is better than life. So, hatred of family and oneself indicates the single-minded loyalty of the disciple to Jesus. Indeed, this divine wisdom can be in conflict with human intentions. Yet, only divine wisdom can save us. No human intention can do that. The second step of discipleship is having a Christ-like attitude, that is, to follow in the footsteps of Jesus by carrying our crosses. Jesus invites his disciples, saying, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and humble of heart. Matthew 11.29 Finally, Jesus does not want us to rush. He wants us to take our time as we make the decision to follow him. He tells us, 
No one, no one who holds the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom. Luke 9:62. Since he does not want us to keep looking back, he admonishes us to be like a builder who first sits down and works out the cost of completing a building before he begins. We should be like a king who weighs the possibility of winning before he embarks on a war. As human beings, our intentions are geared towards success and excellence. Yet, until we begin to think like Jesus, we shall always fail. How did Jesus succeed? Hebrew 12 verses 2 says, For the sake of the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame, and has taken his seat at the right of the throne of God. If you want to attain glory, don't despise the cross. St. Paul says, If we suffer with Christ, we shall share in his glory. Romans 8:17. Finally, dear brothers and sisters, do not despise the discipline of the Lord. For whom the Lord loves, he disciplines as a father, a son in whom he delights. Proverbs 3.11 The Devar Adonai team thanks you for listening. And may Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. To follow our reflections for Sundays and solemnities, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or follow our Facebook page, Devar Adonai, or visit our website, devaradonai.org.